Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so excited about this upcoming mission to Mars. If all goes well, on July 20th of next month, we're going to launch the next Mars rover 2020, Perseverance to Mars. On board that special rover is going to be the first interplanetary helicopter called Ingenuity. It's the helicopter designed specifically to fly on Mars. And I'm so excited to introduce my guest for today, the chief engineer of the helicopter project at JPL, Bob Ballaram. But before we get to my interview with Bob, I'm going to share the space journey story of my friend Aaron Fishbein. Hi, I'm Aaron Fishbein, and my space journey began when I was a young boy and I met Neil Armstrong. Uh, what I'm most excited about for the future of space exploration, I thought about this, and there's so many individual things, you know, getting outside of our solar system or even just exploring uh, different planets or, or moons in our solar system. And then, and then it occurred to me, I was, I was, you know, I've been thinking about these things, reading about these things just for, you know, as long as any, any other space nerd. And, uh, and, and I really thought, you know, what really excites me the most is more of like a philosophical thing, which is, which gets back to that big blue marble thing, you know, which is like, once we get off the planet, do people start realizing this is a, this is our, we're all in this together. And that's, that's, that's what I'm most kind of, I guess, hopeful for, I should say, in uh, space exploration. Your space journey. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing your story. Again, folks, we'd love to hear about your interest in space. If you'd like to submit your own space journey story, just email us at info at or leave us a voicemail by calling 317-862-4700. Now to our exciting interview with Bob Balaram about Mars helicopter Ingenuity. Now Ingenuity is a technology demonstration. It's designed to test powered flight on another world for the first time. Now this is amazing in that the Mars atmosphere is only 1% as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. So as you can imagine, a lot of amazing engineering went into this. So again, here's Bob Balaram, the chief engineer for the Mars helicopter project from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Online Coffee Break. Bob, one of the questions that we like to ask our um, audience is sort of how your interest in space began. Could you share your story? Uh, yeah, I began as a kid, and it really was uh, triggered a lot by the Apollo program. I had an uncle who used to be quite active in getting the latest uh, glossy brochures and materials from the local uh, United States consulate in India. Nice. So I used to read all the stuff that he got and I just cobbled it up and that's how I got interested in space. That's wonderful. Now you're with JPL, obviously, and you're working on uh, Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter, the Mars rover. Can you tell us a little bit more about your current role with Ingenuity? Yes, I'm what's known as the chief engineer. Uh, and I've been the chief engineer um, throughout the project and with both in the phase where we built the helicopter and now over the next uh, year, we're getting ready to operate it on Mars. So it's been as a chief engineer who's responsible for, you know, the technical design and the integrity of the entire end-to-end -end system. Well, that's wonderful. Now, one thing we're all fascinated about is obviously this will be the first time that a helicopter will be flown on another planet. I was just wondering if you can just tell us more, sort of give us a general overview about Ingenuity size and general capabilities. Yes. Um, Ingenuity is a, what we call as a technology demonstration mission. It's to really prove that we can add this new aerial dimension to our exploration of Mars. Uh, so far, we have looked at it from the orbit, we have landed in a few places, and we have rowed in a few others. Uh, rovers are, you know, while very capable, are limited in how far they can go and where all they can, what all they can access. Mm -hmm. And providing an aerial dimension, you know, just like, you know, the explosion of drones here on Earth has added that additional exploration capability, additional mobility capability. 
So that's what we are aiming to demonstrate uh, here on on Mars. Our demonstrator is uh, 1.2, 1.8 kilograms, which is about four pounds. Wow. And it's about 1.2 meters in diameter, which is about four feet. And it's what we have an, on the rover. It will be dropped off. We'll do a technology demonstration. And based upon everything we learn, uh, the next generation of Mars helicopters that would actually be focused on science and exploration would then become possible. See, I think that's wonderful, too, because, again, yeah, the mission, as I understand, of Perseverance, the rover, is obviously kind of searching for signs of ancient life, collecting samples of rock and sediment uh, for possible potential return to the Earth. But as you said, for ingenuity, this is a technology demonstration. Um, can you give us a little bit more, so, sort of what are the parameters of proving the technology works? Right. So we have, you know, built our helicopter and tested it, tested it as much as we could here on Earth. We have a big uh, vacuum chamber that's about eight meters across, uh, that's 25 feet. Um, you know, we pump it down, we backfill it with carbon dioxide, just like Mars. We built a gravity offload device to mimic the effects of Mar lower Mars gravity. And we did a lot of testing of this helicopter uh, here on Earth. But at the end of the day, testing it in the real environment is the real proof of the pit pudding. And so this is an experiment where We'll be conducting the experiment over 30 days on Mars. On Mars, uh, those days are called SOLs, 30 SOLs on Mars. Mm -hmm. And during that phase, we hope to fly about five times. Um, even the first flight will be a tremendous you know, moment for us. Uh, it'll be what we call as our Wright Brothers moment, if you will. <laughs> yes. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, so the course of the five flights, we'll be getting telemetry, a lot of engineering telemetry, and that will really confirm that all the models and computer simulations and design ideas that we had really do work the way we expected to on Mars. So we'll do that experiment for 30 days, and then the Perseverance rover goes on to do its main mission, which is really, you know, look for signs of, you know, life that may have been there in the past. So we're just a little uh, adjunct to that main uh, mission, and uh, we will hope to learn a lot from it. Well, that'll be fascinating. One one thing too, obviously, drones on on Earth they they were plagued with power problems. You know, how how long is it going to last? Now, as, as I understand, for ingenuity, it can receive an electrical charge from the rover, and then afterward, actually generates its own power through a solar panel. I was wondering if you could just tell us more about how it gets its power and how long it typically will last. Right. So. Our Ingenuity helicopter is uh, designed to only fly very short missions. Uh, we are a tech demo. We fly about a minute and a half, two minutes. Um, and whereas in the future, larger helicopters, you know, if, you know, that we would consider like in the 10 to 50 pound um, category would, you know, uh, fly for many minutes uh, compared to our uh, uh, little Ingenuity. So most of our energy during when we're operating on Mars is actually spent uh, just trying to stay warm through the night and heating up various things that need to be heated up before they can be operated before a flight. Only about a quarter to a third of our energy is really used for flight. Sure. Um, so that energy comes from a solar panel. We have a solar panel that can basically top up the battery every day. And if we chose to, we could actually fly every day. Though our team's current thinking is that we'll have a three-day flight cadence because we'll need to understand the results after each flight and plan for the next uh, flight and make sure we, we're doing things safely. Uh, so the solar panel is once we are on the surface. But on the way to Mars, uh, you know, just like your uh, batteries in your uh, uh, various gadgets, you know, eventually drain over time, mm -hmm. we get a periodic burst of charge from the rover on the way to Mars, but once every two weeks or so, just to sort of keep the battery, you know, um, at the right level throughout the entire cruise. And that Power is sent through you know, an electrical line, uh, an umbilical line that separates when we get dropped off onto the surface. So it's the mothership power, you know, the early part of the journey, and after that, it's our solar panels. Oh, that's fascinating. Now, obviously, if, if all goes according to schedule, uh, the mission is scheduled to actually land on Mars in the Jessero Crater on February 18th, 2021. I was wondering, assuming all goes well, when can we expect Ingenuity to begin its first voyage away from the rover? How soon will that occur after Mars landing? Right. So the way the normal rover operations proceed is they land, they check out the vehicle, 
to make sure everything's you know healthy after the landing, and then they transition the software and everything to what they call a uh, a cruise software load, which allows which is more tailored towards the driving and all the things that they need to do on cruise. So once that happens, there are a number of you know mobility systems on the rover that need to be commissioned, things like the driving and you know the cameras and the arms and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so once that is done, they will start heading towards the general direction of where they want to go for their science because it depends on where exactly in the Jezero landing area they land, they'll pick a particular destination. Our analysis indicates that within a couple of hundred meters of their landing spot, they should find us a good spot for our little airfield where we will be doing our flight tests. And so they'll trundle off in that direction. We'll be looking for such a site. As soon as we see, see one, we'll get dropped onto the surface. And that would probably, if everything works out well, that will probably be about within about 60 days of landing on the surface, getting checking the rover, commissioning its driving, and then beginning the search to drop us off. So 60th day, so about two months after landing uh, is, is probably the prime time. Uh, somewhere 60 to 90 days, uh, it'll probably happen. And then we'll spend those uh, 30 souls uh, doing our mission. Oh, that'll be so exciting. I cannot wait. Now, this is kind of a, a different question, but again, we, we mentioned drones earlier, and uh, I, I'm sort of asking if you can just, as an engineer, what is the defining line between a drone and a helicopter? How do you make that distinction? I don't see that much of a distinction. I see it as sort of different axes. I think the, the original meaning of the drone was to indicate the autonomy. I think, I, I don't think, uh, you know, you had drones before you had helicopters, right? You had right. drone, you know, various things. And the helicopter is just a general name for a class of, you know, powered vehicles, right? And whether it, they are, you call them helicopters or whether you call them rotorcraft, they just indicate mechanically, if you will, that this thing, you know, has spinning blades and hovers and so forth. So the two different dimensions, if you want to think about it, the way you could describe an object. But, you know, in popular parlance, you don't always get to control the terminology. Mm -hmm. Um, I just call it a helicopter, and sometimes I call it rotorcraft. If people want to call it a drone, uh, it doesn't bother me. I think uh, we're all talking about the same thing, you know, that first time we fly on Mars. So it'll be... It'll be whatever it is, but it'll be the first flight. See, and and, and I guess another th- amazing thing, again, like you said, this first time we're doing this on Mars. If if I can say this just from an engineering perspective, obviously there's lots of challenges that come along with this tremendous task. What were some of the biggest challenges of creating this unique helicopter? Well, I think the, the main challenge is really the atmosphere on Mars is 1% of Earth. It's Right. equivalent of flying at 100,000 feet here on Earth, and uh, you don't see many helicopters there. No. <laughs> now, the reason that we get a bit of a break on Mars is that the gravity is about you know 40% of what we have here on Earth. So the lower gravity does help, but the, the air is still extremely thin. You know, a cubic meter of air, you know, three feet by three feet by three feet is about a, a kilogram, two pounds here on Earth. Whereas on Mars, that same cubic meter is about less than an ounce, about a half an ounce, you know, about 15 to 18 grams per cubic meter. Mm -hmm. So we spin the blades fast. We have blades that are uniquely tailored for the aerodynamics. Uh, There are some challenges in helicopter control that come with that territory too that we had to overcome. But at the end of the day, you're trying to build this extremely lightweight, almost Gossamer kind of system because you want it to be very low mass so that it can fly in this very thin air. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it has to be rugged and strong like a spacecraft to survive things like launch vibration loads, to survive the entry, descending, and landing loads when you're entering the surface of Mars. Right. And it has to be supported and so forth mechanically. And so it's a challenge to want to have to build a both an aircraft that's so light and and, and delicate. At the same time, it has to be strong. So throughout, that was a major challenge. Um, an additional challenge was that uh, we had to invent a test program. Nobody has written a book on, you know, how do you test uh, an aerial vehicle like this? Right. And so going through a test campaign um, and essentially inventing a test campaign uh, had lots of very interesting uh, uh, rabbit holes, if you will, <laughs> that we had to, you know, explore. And so that was, you know, a, a third leg of the challenge, which, uh, to be very honest, um, if I had known that it was going to be that complex, I probably would have uh, balked at, you know, you know, the job earlier. Uh, <laughs> so those are sort of just intrinsic to the helicopter itself. The first of a kind, 
has to be very lightweight, but it has to be still strong. But then the other thing is uh, we are uh, a passenger or a hitchhiker, however you want to call it, on a flagship mission. Yes. And we have to be extraordinarily safe in all respects, electrical, mechanical, you know, we have to be extremely clean, just like, you know, a lot of the other things on the rover because it's looking for, you know, life-related uh, chemistry and things. Right. And so there's a whole slew of challenges in safety and being compatible with a flagship, what in the NASA parlance are, you know, Class A type missions, you know, which are, we're not, and we're just a little lowly tech demo on it. So trying to get that marriage to work also was a major challenge. But um, I think thanks to the Perseverance team, you know, they were very helpful. And uh, so we have gotten that done. So it's, it's the challenges are multidimensional. Everything yeah. from the physics and the engineering to the unexpectedness of being in a completely new regime. See, and that's what's even more incredible to me. And I have so much respect for, for both uh, of the teams of Ingenuity and Perseverance because you know, obviously with the Mars rover, as if that wasn't impressive enough, but what we started, you could re control that remotely from the Earth. You'd have to wait at least 20 minutes for the round trip from the controller to send the signal. But now with the helicopter, you cannot do that. You cannot fly that uh, from here on Earth. It's got to be completely autonomous, which is incredible because I'm thinking how horrible I am at flying drones. But now it's it's got to be able to take off, fly its mission not go too far <laughs> and and still yep. get back. So I can really appreciate that. It has a wireless communication system. It has computers, navigation centers, and two cameras. I guess, can you tell us more about the equipment that's actually on it in just four pounds? It's incredible. Let me just start from the top and just work my way down. Sure. So I said we have a solar panel on the top, very high efficiency solar cells tuned for the Mars uh, spec, uh, light spectrum. And then also we have a little... Um, antenna sticking up there that's our relay to our base station which is bolted onto the rover itself and the base station receives all the radio uh, information they, and then it sends it to the rover which can then send it back to earth then as you come lower you got the two spinning rotors uh, this is what we call as a coaxial configuration they're both spinning on the same axis one goes clockwise one goes the other way it's not torque cancelling that way you don't need a tail rotor so that's the one that can, for our flights on Mars, we expect to spin those up to about 2,400 RPM. Um, and they're, that's what provides the lift. Uh, they're very lightweight. Each of those four blades, two on the top, two on the bottom, each of them is just about an ounce. Wow. So it's very cool. lightweight uh, rotor system. Um, then you have the motors. And below all of that, you have a fuselage, which contains... Um, the computing avionics, it can, has all the sensors that we have. We have a downward-looking camera that lets us see how far we are moved laterally. So that tells us velocity, lateral velocity. We have um, an inertial measurement unit, which is basically a combination of three gyros and three accelerometers that tells us, you know, how we, how we, are, how we are moving around. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a laser altimeter, which tells us, you know, how high we are off the ground. Uh, we have a lithium-ion battery pack in there, keeping warm, surrounded by electronics boards, surrounded by some very innovative uh, insulation uh, uh, and thermal systems to keep it warm through the night. And then finally, we have the feet uh, that, you know, uh, allow us to land on the surface. So you have that whole sequence of things, and uh, each one of those was uh, managed <laughs> down to the gram level <laughs> and we ended up at uh you know where we are at, at four pounds wow <laughs> bob that is incredible uh one last question if i may just more of just an emotion what are you personally most looking forward to about this mission and ingenuity well as, as i said i think it's the wright brothers moment for us so in terms of a technical accomplishment for the team flying for the first time on another planet with a power flight uh, you know, is a is a breakthrough milestone, and I think you'll see more of that uh, with the Dragonfly mission coming up. You know, in the 2030s, when they'll be flying, mm -hmm. um, you know, on Titan. So that's the first of a kind moment. But the more important moment, I th think, for me, is that I think it really enables a whole new way of exploring Mars. And there's, uh, imagine if we were exploring Earth and we had uh, looked at it from the orbit and we had landed in uh, three or four places and driven, you know 
20 miles, you know, here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still a lot of other explore- exploring you, you could do. On, and so in a similar way, on Mars, there's a lot of exploring that can happen uh, with a, the kind of mobility, the kind of reach, the kind of range you have, that, and the, really the, the close-up uh, high-resolution stuff uh, that you can do with, uh, with helicopters. Um, I call it the three R's, you know, uh, reach, range, and resolution. That's what helicopters bring to the table. So getting that enabled, I think, would be a, a major uh, thing for me. Oh, that's incredible. Well, we certainly uh, wish you and your team at JPL just the the best of luck. We're certainly rooting for ingenuity and perseverance. And Bob, I just want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you again. Okay, you're, you're welcome. Online Coffee Break. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Bob today, and I'm so excited about Mars First Helicopter Ingenuity. Also, of course, excited about Mars 2020 Rover Perseverance. Cannot wait for that. If all goes well, they're going to be landing on Mars in February of 2021. It's going to be exciting. If you'd like to learn more, just go to the website mars.nasa.gov. I want to thank Bob for joining me today. I want to thank Aaron for sharing his space journey earlier on in the episode. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us today as well. Again, thank you so much. If you'd like to share this episode with a friend, we'd certainly appreciate it. If you could give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast application, we'd certainly appreciate that as well too. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.